So one of the things that companies do when cocoa prices are high is they come up with a whole bunch of funky new flavors where they'll add biscuits or caramel and sea salt or lots of other infusions and uh, things that are just cheaper than chocolate. So you'll see that happening more and more. This episode is proudly brought to you by Mapper Forwards Workshop. It's time to become a coffee consultant. Learn how to diversify your revenue streams and create freedom from your day job while saying goodbye to that alarm clock forever by becoming a consultant within the coffee industry or directly to consumers who have shifted towards home brewing and home roasting. Protect your income from challenging times in the coffee value chain by taking this course today. Go to mapperforward.coffee forward slash workshops or click the link in the show notes for details. Welcome to the Daily Coffee Pro by Mapper Forward Friends. I'm your host, Lee Safar. This is episode four of a five-part series. We are talking with Anthony Fountain about what's happening in cacao. Now, in this episode, we're going to be talking about the role of big corporations in cacao. In the last episode, we talked about the poverty that exists for coffee producers in, uh, in cacao, but also in agriculture in general. One thing that you'll notice, uh, Anthony, is that we never seem to connect the idea of poverty, poverty with big corporations. And what strikes me is that when, as we were talking about power dynamics in the last episode, and we bring that back into, in, continue that conversation in this episode, the big corporations never really ever have to give up any of their power dynamics until mm. we reach a moment like what we have right now where the supply is under threat. What role are the big corporations looking at playing in the current situation? So I think part of that answer, and we'll dive into that a lot deeper in the episode after this, is around the regulatory field. Because um, mm -hmm. so far, the reason why companies haven't really solved any of the sustainability problems in their supply chain um, is because they didn't have to. It was always right. part of, you know, if your CEO had a good morning, uh, you know, he might approve a, a nice charity, a charitable project, right? If it fit in there, you know, in your annual budget, you might be able to do something that's fun. If you feel that you can get a good PR angle or a hook off this, or if it provides nice photos that your CEO goes to visit some schools somewhere in West Africa and, you know, photogenic uh, photo op. Yeah then you might do it as well. Um, it's just never allowed to cost too much. It's never allowed to affect your core business very much. And I think that that's been a big part of the challenge is that sustainability has always been charity, not justice. Um, but these companies have been very willing for decades, if not centuries, to source their product from places where they knew the planet was being trashed, the people were being treated poorly, and everyone was poor. <laughs> so there's always been a very implicit understanding of the fact that they're part of the problem, even though, and I th think it's important to say there's a difference between the company as, a, as an entity and individual people that work within the company. And mm -hmm. I've, I have found in my last, well, in the, in the 20 years of doing this, that I really have to distinguish between those two because there's a lot of good people that work at bad companies. Um, and Who are willing uh, to do, who, who have to do bad things in order to execute on behalf of the company. And sometimes try to change that from the inside. Sometimes try to address that, like... Hardly a week goes by without at least somebody in, in one of the large companies reaching out saying, hey, I need your help on convincing my boss or, hey, can we talk about how mm -hmm. I pitched this internally or, hey, we're doing something really crap that you're not allowed to know about it and you don't have it from me, mm. but this is what we're about to do. Can you cause a stink about it? Because I don't want to be doing this, right? So That's sad. Um, well... It's also the way these corporations, they are so huge and they are so powerful, but they are so beholden to power as well. And so kind of, unless you rein in that power, 
that power will become more and more self-contained and self-serving, which is mm. where I think, and in the next, in the next session, we'll be talking about regulation a lot more. Mm -hmm. um, you're going to have to rein in that power somehow. And for the last 40 years, we've been living in a time frame where what they call the Washington consensus, the neoliberal agenda of deregulation has been kind of the leitmotif of all thinking around how we structure the global system. As long as we have the, the, the less rules that as possible, create the more, most freedom, create the best situation for everybody. We mm. all know that that is patently wrong, right? I mean, it, you only have to open the news to see what the effects of that are, whether that is climate change or deforestation mm. or worker abuse, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so there's a real complex interplay between what the role of governments is and what the role of companies is. And, um, and about 12 years ago, um, 13 years ago, the, the, the United Nations guiding principles on business and human rights were developed. And, um, that's, they were developed by a very long, complex process trying to make this about as neutral as possible. It's not a bunch of raging leftist NGOs that wrote it. It was also not a bunch of libertarian companies that wrote it. It was some academia that spent a lot of time trying to get about as honest and as fair a framework of how should companies respect human rights in their business practices. And they came out with a surprisingly simple framework where basically there's only three principles that you need to adhere to in order to properly do it. And the mm -hmm. first principle being governments have the duty to protect human rights. They need to step up, protect human rights, and stand up against the power of companies in this. The second principle was companies need to respect human rights regardless of whether governments have done their first duty well, right? So you cannot point at governments and say they haven't done their job as an excuse for you not to do your job of respecting human rights. And the third of the guiding principles is when you're a victim of human rights abuses in a supply chain, you have the right to a remedy. So you have to have, be able to access grievance claims. You have to be able to put in a complaint. You have to be recompensed if some things are wrong. It, that is kind of the simplicity of the frame. There's a lot of detail and nuance there, but that's basically where it comes down to. So. What is the role of companies in all of this? They need to do the right thing regardless of what the governments are doing around them. Now, that is a hard sell because companies tend to not do that. There's a difference between family-owned companies and between publicly traded companies is my experience. So family-owned companies are much more willing initially to make big bold new steps to try things differently, et cetera. Now, and that is also not a rule that always applies. I would say that one of the companies that also in the cocoa sector has been willing to do some of the more bold new attempts at doing things right is Nestle, which is a publicly traded company and which is not per se known in the NGO world for being the nicest or the most ethical or moral company. I think since they've tried to poison baby kids for profits in the 80s in Africa, there's been quite a... Well, uh, you know, uh, they fucked over coffee producers in Mexico as well. Like, they allegedly... And they do this on a regular basis 100%. if you look at kind of indigenous water rights, etc. But if you look at what allegedly. Nestle's been doing on, on, on child labor, if you look at what Nestle's been doing on kind of raising farmer income in the cocoa sector, you could probably, you know, there's a really easy argument to say that they're on the more progressive side of stuff. But but we do find that that's continuous internal struggle there where the guys that are trying to run that are always finding the upstairs people that are very much looking at efficiency gains and things like that. So what right. we see in um, what we see in the role of these companies is is that they can do a lot more than they're generally speaking willing to do because there's a business model that is always, at, at, pardon me, there's a business model that's always at tension with mm. doing the right thing. So if, if this cacao crisis continues, let's say another year, mm -hmm. another two years, yep. what happens to the Kit Kat? Oh. It depends. 
So KitKat has virtually no cocoa in it, right? The, the, the outside layer of KitKat has got, I think it's got a 30% cocoa content. So right. um, chocolate bars might become more expensive. But, at the, you know, before the price crisis hit, a chocolate bar, maybe four to six cents per dollar were what the farmer was getting. So if that price doubles, triples, shouldn't become more than 10, 15 cents per dollar more expensive, which is a price rate price hike that we saw two years ago in the global inflation crisis as well. And that didn't end the consumption of chocolate. In fact, you know, one could argue that the wage theft that went through that inflation increase, um, you know, a wage theft is when prices go up a lot, but kind of the people working inside those systems don't get paid a lot mm -hmm. more and companies make a lot more profits. And then to be honest, um, you know, even in earning calls, the big companies have been, you know, in the last couple of years before this price crisis oh, hit. they're crushing. Being very, very satisfied about how they were having they're extremely, crushing. extremely good years. So um, with the high co prices, I'm not going to lie to you, it's it's a tricky market to survive in at the moment. And I think particularly the smaller traders are going to really, really struggle. Um, but What but about supply? What? That's that's my big question here. It's like, okay, you've so, got so the thing is, a, a block of chocolate and sure, it's mostly sugar and it's mostly milk and it's mostly yep. all of that other stuff, but it still mm -hmm. is cacao. You can't have it without cacao. What if no, the... Yeah, so, go on. Go ahead. Sorry. No. Um, so one of the things that companies do when cocoa prices are high is they come up with a whole bunch of funky new flavors where they'll add biscuits or caramel and sea salt or lots of other infusions and uh, things that are just cheaper than chocolate. So you'll see that happening more and more. Where you'll okay. see company experiment okay, with that's basically what I'm the recipe. And the thing is, um, most people don't mind that, right? They'll put nuts in there. They'll put hazel. They'll put, there's lots of stuff you can add to cocoa. It's not something that's like, only eaten straight. And in fact, the people that only eat the straight chocolate uh, um, tend to often be willing to pay a little bit more for their chocolate anyway, et cetera, right. et cetera. So, so you see um, less of the- that Or of they'll the... change the packaging sizes. So right. you'll see kind of packaging, shrinkage, shrinkage et cetera. Um, and they'll be, they tend to be subtle about it. Not always. Mondelez, the owner of Toblerone, a couple of years ago tried to mm -hmm. do that increasing the space between the triangles and you should have seen the public backlash against that it was it was the, i mean if you talk about a mistake that was an oopsie that definitely i'm sure that one or two people were no longer employed by that company at the end of that first day of media outrage so that's an example of how you shouldn't do it most companies do that on a regular basis so you'll see a bar of 200 grams go down to 180 grams well, we're seeing that on mass now. That's, yep. that's the cost of living crisis is causing that. What's very exciting and interesting about this time, uh, particularly for someone like me who is quite the observer of a lot of these things all converging on each other, is the fact that they're encouraging, uh, converging. The fact mm -hmm. that you've got a cost of living crisis converging with an economic crisis, converging with a climate crisis, converging mm -hmm. with a whole bunch of stuff that's going on in agriculture. And that's just like, a very tiny percentage of the things that are going on uh, in not just in coffee, not just in cacao, but in general, you're seeing shrinkage in hair dye. It's amazing. I went, uh, when you buy a box of hair dye now, you mm -hmm. notice that for someone with the hair length, my hair length, I used to be able to use one box every time mm -hmm. I dyed my hair. Now I mm -hmm. need to use two, not because for, my hair is For those longer. of you that are not for those of you that are not watching this but are listening to this, I'd just like to point out that some things are not always very equal. And so <laughs> myself, I am a typical 45-year-old white guy. I started going bold about five years ago, and I have like I have a very bold head. So I am looking at Lee complaining about hair dye, going like I'm not complaining. I wish, I wish I had your problems, Lee. There's I'm not I'm sorry, this is one of those issues where I'm not like um, I'm not. That's first world problems there, Lee. That um, is good. I'm making a point. <laughs> Am I I'll point? <laughs> problem any day. <laughs> so my point is that the shrinkage is existing. That's very funny, I must say. The 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 
the the thing is what we're starting to notice is that you know even in things like hair dye you're starting to notice that the amount the bottle size is the same mm -hmm. the tube size is the same but they mm -hmm. are putting less product inside them so yep. that now you have to buy two packets rather than one to be able to dye your roots and yes i have a mm -hmm. lot of hair but that's the same amount of dye used to be able the same package used to be able to cover all of my hair this is something that you're starting to notice in everything you're noticing bucket bucket uh butter sizes are getting smaller mm -hmm. uh you know coffee bag sizes clients are saying to me can i just reduce the size of my my bags can i go from 250 to 200 well, you could, but what I would encourage is that you just increase the price and keep the product the same because it's more honest. And and it's it's also part of a of a of, of a movement that we've seen definitely in the last 10, 15 100%. years. Where everything, every business process is optimized to the highest efficiency. Like we've screened mm -hmm. everything to its maximum. Not, and I think this is important to point out, not to reduce consumption, not to reduce waste, not to maximize to profits, footprints, but to maximize profits for shareholders. And actually often not for the people that are working for her at the company, but for the people that own it. And so what we're yes. seeing is, and this is how we've seen people like Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk and, and others where we've seen the rich getting so much richer just in the last mm. five, six years as well, is there's this real race to, to have more. And the thing is, is the people that are very rich are so very, they really don't need all that money. I mean, I'm a really big fan of capping capitalism at like, let's say a hundred million. Once you get a hundred million, you get a, you get a building named after you get a plaque that says, congratulations, you've won capitalism. And everything above that, we just tax at a hundred percent tax rate, full stop. Whether that's capital gains, income, ownership, just take it away. Nobody needs that amount of money. And the problem is that when you do have that amount of money, you gain an inordinate amount of power. And just because you're rich didn't give you the right to dictate how the world is organized. And even on a smaller level, we sometimes get that. I worked for a, for a not-for-profit organization. So sometimes we get donors that come up to us, right? It doesn't happen very often, but a couple of months ago, I was talking to, to, to a tech, um, a very rich tech entrepreneur that wanted to talk to us about kind of funding our work. And in exchange for that, that person wanted to be able to provide input in what we're doing and uh, done with the biggest integrity that they, that they had. Right. I mean, I'm not blaming them at all. They're like, I want to do something good with, with, with what I've been given. Right. I think that's, that's great. Mm -hmm. But why should rich people have more of a say about how we develop solutions for s sustainability than the rest of us? It's a highly undemocratic way of coming up with solutions as well. It also has a huge confirmation bias because it means that people that get rich through technology, et cetera, often tend to think that technology is the best thing since sliced bread. And they actually think that technology is the solution to the world's problems. But the thing is, the world's problems are not technological in nature. Mm. The world's problems are economical, yeah. even spiritual or political in nature. And there are no technological solutions to economic, spiritual, and political problems. You need to bring in Answers to how do you deal with greed? You don't deal with greed through technology. How do you deal with overconsumption? You don't deal with that through technology. You deal with that by tackling the consumption. And that's a political problem around the distribution of, mm. of risk, reward, and responsibility. And that's where you need to start looking at. And this is why I think it's such an exciting time to be a coffee producer or to be a cacao producer. Because at the end of the day, we can make this very, very simple. We can take a very complex uh, structure that you're talking about and make it very, very simple. Mm. If there is no cacao or if we decide not to sell you the cacao, you can't have the cacao. Mm -hmm. That's a very simple shift in power dynamic. Now, it's way more complicated than that, and I get that. But well, you need to do it collectively, but then it actually does become that sim simple. Exactly. Like, That's my point. Yeah. That's my point. Yeah. Is that 
we have come to realize through the creation of the project that we're in the process of creating mm -hmm. that the information that we're about to get to coffee producers has been gatekept by organizations like we mentioned in this series. Mm -hmm. It has been gatekept from green coffee traders and from roasters. And, and so the gatekeeping has been done by people who do not want producers to be empowered with this information mm -hmm. so that they can make decisions that would better their own position. And so that's a real reason why people come mm -hmm. to organizations like you and say, let me give you this money, but at the same time, I would like to uh, control the way that the information is getting there. The same as people come to me, Lee, can we come and sponsor the podcast? But we don't want you to talk about this. We don't want you to talk about this. And we don't want you to talk about this. Yeah. We have had governments come here to Dubai and have meetings with me and ask me, what will it cost to terminate the podcast? Hmm. We do not want the information getting disseminated to the rest of the world that you're giving them. Hmm. What do you think that says about the way that people are trying to gatekeep information so that people don't get empowered? Power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. And we see that, you know, there. The will to power means that you also want to maintain that power. And mm. um, the reason why we do what we do at Voice is because it doesn't matter what system you're in, whether you're in a highly capitalist or a highly communist, highly state-structured system, there will always be power, regardless mm. of whether that power is corporate or, or, or government power. And that power will always have to be held accountable. That's where we come in because we try Eventually. to help guys. That's where we try to help organize the countervailing power. And I, and I do that based on this principle. And this ties into the thing like farmers need to understand where their power lies. Their power lies not in individual action. It lies in collective action. Yeah. Um, and so there's this Dutch communist uh, architect that lived about 150 years ago. He actually, he's best known for designing the, the Dutch uh, um, uh, trade, uh, 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 the, the, like our Wall Street in the okay. Netherlands, named after him. Um, but he was a communist architect and he built with bricks. And he said, I always build with bricks as a symbol because a brick on its own is insignificant, but in mass has power. And that's what we try to do as well. We realize that individual voices tend to be insignificant, but in mass have power. It's literally the only thing that has ever significantly helped workers' rights, for example, mm. is when workers started to work together, the 40-hour work week, the five-hour, right. five-day work week, maternity leave, paternity leave, paid sick leave, all of that stuff is all a direct result of collective action. And that is... Definitely one of the two key ingredients in bringing about change, collective action. The other is regulatory action. We'll talk about that more mm -hmm. in the next podcast. But what is the role of corporations? I would actually argue, because coming back to this question, kind of what is the role of companies in this? The role of companies in this is to do the right thing regardless of whether others are doing the right thing. I would argue that the role of companies is not to maximize their profits. But interestingly enough, the Mars family that owned the Mars company, um, they hired a senior economist about 15 years ago, maybe 20, a guy called Bruno Roche, a Belgian economist. And they, they gave him one assignment. They said, you need to find out what the right level of profit for our company is. Mm -hmm. Figure out, what is it maximum profit? Is it how, how do we do this? You need to come up with a framework to help us understand what the right level of profit. So they actually started challenging the assumption that maximization of profit was the outcome they needed. Now, what is the right level? Mm -hmm. And so he started working on some of the concepts. Actually, Forrest Mars, the, the, the founder of the Mars company in the 1950s, he wrote a memo to all of the people working at Mars saying, We've got a couple of values in the company. And one of these values is what he called the economics of mutuality. Everyone involved needs to get better from the involvement in our company. Mm. Now, fair to say that at the moment, that is not the case. Cocoa farmers are really in trouble, right? Um, but at least they've started asking themselves that question. Right. What is What should be our right level of profit? Um, I, I feel that that could 
impact their daily operations a lot more than it has. But I find it fascinating that a company asks themselves that question and actually has asked themselves that so publicly because Bruno has then gone and spoken about this and created, actually, he's now taken the think tank they had within Mars and turned that into an independent entity called, I think it's the Mutuality Foundation, something like that, looking at what those economics of mutuality should look like. So I think these words and this thinking that we see in the Mars structure is really interesting in that. I'd love to see that a lot more translated in their actions, right? And I into the actions of a lot of other companies, but I think that is actually what a company should do is not wait until they're forced to, but companies actually can choose to. This is a lot harder to do for companies that have external shareholders, that basically right. the minute you're a shareholder-owned company, you're almost designing yourself mm. to have to deliver every quarter. And that's a race might, to the bottom. It is always a race for the workers and for the planet. The it's suppliers. a race up for the owners of the shares. And that's where a problem lies. And that's where we need governments again, because I think it was AOC in, in, um, uh, in the States that says every billionaire is a policy failure. And well, I, think I, I think that that's kind of unfair. Like it's so complicated. I'm not for or against billionaires. What I am for is the fact that we could be doing this better. And mm. we're failing it. We're failing at doing this well. What so, we're saying is that only one can win here. It, when you're looking at a supply chain, the, the, the business that is at the end of that supply chain is the one that gets to win here and everybody else gets fucked over. And, yeah. and this sets us up perfectly, perfectly mm -hmm. for our next yeah. conversation about regulation. So let's go and have the conversation about regulation <laughs> so that we don't make this a full half hour episode. <laughs> I, love, I love to challenge the concept billionaires because we, we are, we will, I promise we will in the next episode. Let me, let me end at that. There is a difference between billionaires and millionaires, right? So, I get it. Because no, but I actually, our brains aren't designed to understand the difference in scale between those. Like the, and this is the best calculation I can give. A million seconds is about 11 days. A billion seconds is 32 years. And that's the difference in power that we're talking about. Right. People have several millions. That's fine. A billion is too much power for any person and it should be forbidden. Full stop. And everybody that comes on this podcast that tries to get that uses that exact analogy. So yep. <laughs> let's talk about the regulation and the role of billionaires in that in the next episode. Yep. Peace, yep. love and peanut butter. Have an amazing rest of your day. I really hope you enjoyed this episode, friends. Please don't forget to show us some love by subscribing, liking, commenting, and most of all, sharing this podcast with your friends. Check the show notes for links, including our sponsors and our Patreon. And stay tuned for more great conversations on the Daily Coffee Pro by Mapper Forward.